Hi, hi everybody. Uh, I'm Jonathan Ozali, and I am a fourth year mechanical engineer, and I'm going to be talking to you guys about control systems and specifically how to design it for uh, an SAE vehicle, uh, whether it be IC or EV. Um, just in general, don't be afraid to just go ask a question. I know some some of this stuff is just kind of weird, and, you know. I get it. So don't don't be afraid to like raise your hand and ask something. Um, I am the torque vectoring lead. Uh, long story short, uh, I optimize the, each individual wheel's torque to make sure that the turn uh, is as efficient as possible. That's the very basic version of it. I'll be going in more detail throughout the presentation and so on. Um, just a couple of quick things. Uh, obviously, the agenda is on the left here, but uh, the design for a control system is very, 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 very similar to designing any other part. So uh, you, you still have to define your problem. You still have to figure out what you're designing your control system for. Uh, you still have to do background research on it. Uh, and of course, I'll be going into more detail about all these segments as well. Uh, you still have to know what your requirements are. You still have to know what, how to figure this stuff out, how to go and find a solution for it, how to make a solution for it. Um, you need to know how to know how to prototype it. You need to know how to make it. And you need to understand everything you're doing along the way. Uh, and then obviously, if it meets it, you know, be able to communicate it. You don't have to go through any of the previous steps yet. Uh, and if it doesn't meet all your requirements, you go back and repeat the process. It's, it's just design 101. It's the same process instead of building a actual physical model of it. You're now just having an electronic model of it or a, a coded model of it. So uh, moving forward, a couple of acknowledgments. Uh, control systems are based on a system that's already in place with all the variables that are included with it. Basically saying control system is focusing on something that already exists. Say I'm working with the engine and I'm trying to do a control system for the engine specifically, I need to know all the variables that are going on with that. I'd consult Ben over here if that were the case. Uh, if I'm talking about suspension, I'd talk to Trevor last week, which I actually do. Um, all these things require a lot of communication between your sub-team or the control system sub-team as uh, in communicate with whatever teams that are going to be you're going to be working in conjunction with. Uh, so don't be afraid to ask those other teams. Uh, the more precise you are, the better. So the more that you know about what you're interacting with, the better. Um, this is going to be focused on mechanical engineering. This is going to be more on the mechanical engineering side. Uh, clearly, I'm a mechanical engineer. I'm not really a software engineer, or computer engineer. We touch into that kind of basis. We do a little bit of C++. We dip our toes into that ocean, but we're not diving in. Uh, we have people who are much better suited for that. We have the people who work with the VCU, uh, the Vehicle Control Unit. They are tremendous at what they do. So again, consult them. Don't be afraid to interact, because this is one of those fields that you end up talking to a lot of people to make sure you're as precise as possible. Uh, so likewise, because my focus is torque vectoring, uh, a lot of the examples I'll be giving you guys are going to be going down those paths as well. So. Um, I'll be referencing that a lot. I'll be clarifying whatever uh, information needs clarifying. And of course, again, ask if you need to. Um, references can be found in the FSAE database and the SVN. It's just an excellent wealth of knowledge to have. It's a good place to access in general. Uh, a lot of the stuff that I've been referencing as far as documents go directly from there. Um, and of course, I'll be posting a couple things on the SVN that are from the database as well. So you know, there should be some shared knowledge there. Uh, and for anybody who's a mechanical engineer going to UCR, a couple of classes that are super helpful with this, uh, with this topic are ME20 or 120 and 121, both taught usually by Professor Franco. Um, those are talking about linear systems and controls uh, and then the frequency that you're dealing with. Um, frequency is going to be more common in the testing phase and you're going to be adding stuff to your system. That comes a little later on with things called Nyquist and Bode plots. Just is basically dealing with the natural and uh, force frequencies of the system in the actual uh, car. It, a lot more detail in the actual class, just letting you guys know that that'd be a good class to take. Uh, 122 is vibrations. Uh, you're going to be dealing with that a lot. Uh, a lot, a lot, a lot. So uh, highly recommend that you guys take that and, and look into that if you guys are really interested in doing control systems for both the IC or the EV cars, which I think we're focusing on EV, if I'm not mistaken. So. Either way, vibrations are going to be a huge factor there. So, 
And then finally, 133 and 145, which are mechatronics and robotics, respectively. Both of them are taught by Pascaletti, who does an excellent job of explaining logic circuits and robotic logic. So mechatronics is just purely if then or statements that basically give you a set of inputs and then an output binary uh, values using binary values. So it's just excellent in like helping out with the logic of that. And you, if I know you've taken uh, taken that before, you'll see it. You've already seen it. It looks very similar. Yeah, definitely. When I was going through this, I definitely saw a lot of stuff that I saw in ME one thirty three. Um, a lot of the mechatronic stuff just seems like. It looks like it's really permanent. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, and then 145 is a lot of robotic logic or robot uh, robotics. Excuse me. Um, it's basically if a robot's running into a wall but doesn't know how to get around the wall, how do you get around the wall? It's it's just a good way of looking at these kind of problems. It's a good way to look at these solutions. If there's a wall in front of you, how are you going to get past that wall? It just it's a good way to look around how you're going to solve solutions mathematically, uh, physically, whatever. So. <coughs> forward. Uh, just to sum up control systems, uh, gonna be, I, I wrote a bunch of these, so I'm just going to be reading off a bunch of it. <laughs> so a control system is a system of, or, of devices or a set of devices that manages, commands, directs, or regulates the behavior of other devices or systems to achieve a desired result. Uh, sum that up, control system wants the ideal. It wants the optimal option. So for example, with torque vectoring, you want to be able to take that exact tight curve exactly how the driver commands it. You want that dr driving angle, you got it. That's the whole point of it. You don't want any understeer or oversteer, you want exactly what it wants. So that's control systems in general, right? So with, with a plane, if, you're, if you start experiencing turbulence, there's a control system to help counteract the turbulence or the vibrations to make sure that the ride is as least turbulent as possible. So that there's like less damage to the vehicle as well as uh, to the aircraft as well as the least amount of jostling in the inside of the cabin, jostling. Excuse me. Um, so likewise, control system uses a combination of physics, block diagrams, logic circuits, Bode plots, Nyquist plots, uh, depending on what systems are being controlled or analyzed. Um, physics, that's kind of a given because um, <laughs> you're going to be dealing with some system and it's going to have some governing equation that's dealing with it. Some factor that you're going to have to be working with, that's just going to happen. So you, you'll have to be accounting for those kind of things. Block diagrams, it's just a very useful tool to help dictate your logic going through uh, some control system. So you, you're going to have your set inputs, you're going to have your set outputs. It essentially shows the path that it takes you to get there. Um, logic circuits, uh, that comes a little later on, but it's just helpful to, again, have for when you make that block diagram. Uh, fairly simple. And then Bode and Nyquist plots. Um, Bode will talk more about the frequency of, of the system itself. So it talks about the, um, off the top of my head, I apologize. I want to say it's the, the vibrational and then the, the moment. I can't remember off the top of my head. Ask me later, I can clarify for that for you guys. Uh, Nyquist uh, dwells in which possibilities of frequencies are going to be realistic for what you're talking about, and then which range will not be plausible, or just will be kind of indeterminable. Uh, problem solving a control system completely depends on the system's output requirements. So your physics problem is going to change if you're talking about air intake versus if you're talking about the physics of the car just by position. Because now one, one has to deal with a lot of fluids, the other one just has to deal with gravity. It's just simple as that. You know what you're dealing with when it comes to any kind of system. So a couple of examples. Uh, I wrote mechanical corrections. It's kind of uh, a way of saying biomechanical. Um, your body, for example, if you're falling forward, your right leg or your left leg will catch you. That is a good example of like what a control system might do. Right? It's either I catch myself or I'm going to fall flat on my face, which unless I want a broken nose, not really the way you want to do that. Same thing if you're falling over, you balance yourself by countering your own weight. That's what a control system might do, just as far as a biomechanical way might go. Uh, the most common example, and this has popped up in easily six or seven of my classes um, coming through my four years of, of college here, 
um, is the spring dampening system. Uh, it's the best way to kind of counteract uh, if you have too much sun uh, of one direction, uh, the damper might help counteract that, or the spring will push it back into the right position uh, depending on the forces that are acting on it. So it, it just varies on what the, what the position of your actual suspension is. And of course, uh, I go into the math, but that's boring. Um, and then of course the torque vectoring system, uh, like I was saying earlier, uh, it just optimizes your turn. Without an active torque vectoring system, you just kind of go with an oversteer and you wouldn't have full control over the torque of your vehicle, just be 25 across the board. And you just, if, if you've experienced some failure on one end, it'll be that the torque is not compensating enough for your shift of weight. <coughs> Um, with torque vectoring, you, it allows for the shift of weight to be a factor in your turning, so it just helps in your your radius, which is the more, like I said, the more precise it is, the better. So uh, that's what torque vectoring is as an example. So first comes defining the problem. That's the most that's the most common way of getting around these things. Uh, so for example, what system are you designing the control system for, and what are its variables? So if I were to say, for example, uh, if we needed a control system for fluid output or for air intake, what might some of the variables be? Yeah. As far as like the intake on the uh, cargoes, uh, some of the variables, you'll have the pressure inside of the inlet, you'll have the uh, throttle position sensor. Um, if you had a way to vary your runners, which some teams do, then you might have a runner variable length. You're gonna have your engine RPMs, Cover just about most of it. Cam right. timing would be a big one. So let's let's use some of those as an example then. We have pressure. So let's say we've got a pressure gauge somewhere, and if it reads anywhere within the allowed range, you let it function as is. If it dips below, the system might try and correct it to move in the opposite direction, or if it gets too pressurized, release somewhere. But the whole point is that you now have a variable that you're looking at specifically. It narrows what you're looking at, right? If if we were to do a control system for that, we'd have an escape valve of some kind, or you know, you, you'd go into depth about knowing what that system is and how you might counteract having too much or too little pressure. Just, just as an off the top of the head example, you know, if I just said make a control system for air in, uh, for an air intake thing, and there were no variables that you knew knew of, it's kind of scary to look at. But just by talking to him for 30 seconds, I now have at least one variable, two variables if you're looking at RPM. Uh, that specifically can relate to your air intake. That, that just varies, that just narrows down your field by that much. Um, same thing with like torque vectoring for us, it's just distribution of weight, center of mass. Like a lot of these things we didn't know before a few weeks ago. So now that I know them, it just makes the whole process a lot easier. Right now I can go and make a proper model based on all of these values just because I have them now. And then that scope just helps so much. Uh, Number two, does that system have a desired output? If so, what do the remaining variables, or how do the remaining variables vary the result of that output? So, for example, uh, with torque vectoring, your desired output is exactly what the steering angle is. You want to get to that point. Or you want to get to the point where your, uh, anytime that you have a lot of weight on one tire, you want that one to carry more weight than the other ones. You want essentially everything to move in conjunction with one another. You want to reach that ideal turning uh, turning radius by counteracting some of that off-putting center of mass weight in your torque. That, those, those are just some of the, the examples of, of a desired output. Your angle, that specific angle is a desired output for, output for torque vector. Um, and then number three, do you know the original system well? If not, you must consult the team leads in, uh, in charge of whatever systems are involved. That's a given, right? I have, I'm, I'm almost clueless when it comes to air intake, but I talked to him for 30 seconds and all of a sudden I've got that much more understanding of it. And sit down, have a 30 minute conversation about it, that solves a lot of problems when it comes to this process. Like I sat down with Trevor after that lecture last week uh, for about an hour and clarified a bunch of, uh, of uh, variables that I was misunderstood about. It helps tremendously, just sitting down with somebody, yeah. So like, do we ever have to like, uh like think about like the the kind of tire it is when we're like looking at a torque vectoring like yeah the, like the tire compound or something like how it's going to react with the it, road it depends on how you approach your solution but some solutions yes uh, because some account for uh, the reactions to the ground the specific frictions that you're dealing with 
um, with the interaction with the ground. Um, some with some of them, it did, like the air pressure may differ here and there. Uh, the height of it might be a little different. It's there's a lot of factors that go into the tire. Specifically, the solution I'm working with doesn't really involve that too much, or at least the early stages doesn't. Um, but it depends completely on how you go about the solution, because so there are there are quite a few solutions for like torque vectoring. Essentially, we're going to design like one torque vectoring system to, that would work with like any kind of tire. Uh, sort of. So the way the way it works with us is we use, we're using like a shifting weight situation. I'll be going over. Um, the whole block diagram in a bit, but uh, to sum it up, we're using that shifting weight, not necessarily the reaction on the car itself, as the as the motivating factor. Because for us, since we're all the tires are the same, and either way, they're going to be experiencing that shift in weight. That's what we're accounting for. We're looking at the shift in weight, not necessarily the interaction with the ground yet. Yeah. So the change in tire might change the shift in weight, and we'll react to how that shift in weight is. But we're always just looking at the shift in weight. If I ran yeah. Exactly. So, anyway, that's defining the problem. And I have turned it off. <laughs> My mistake. All right. So, once you have a general consensus of what you're trying to go for, like if I'm if I'm doing an air intake system, if I'm working on a control system for air intake, I now need to do as much background research as at least I need to. Hope ideally you want to do as much as possible, uh, but you do as as much as you need to for the specific control that you're doing. Um, and you'll need to know what those variables do and why those outputs are desired. What specifically are you looking for? What, why the pressure, why is it that that specific pressure is going to be ideal and not lower than a certain range or higher than a certain range? You know, these are certain things you're just going to need to know inherently, right? So if you're, if, if that control system ends up failing, you need to understand what will come of it, right? Because if it ends up if something ends up happening and, and like not even he's sure what happened, at least you have a better idea of, it, well, my control system only fails under this condition, so maybe that's the reason. It, it, it's kind of a weird symbiotic relationship where you two can kind of benefit off of each other, although you know everything. So, uh, <laughs> that far. Uh, so you'll need a plan of attack, so background research really does help with that. Uh, especially like if, if for torque vectoring, for example, there were so many papers that were talking about torque vectoring, but they had almost a little to nothing about how to design the process or how what kind of solutions they were doing. They were just talking about it as a general concept, which is helpful for knowing it. But once you've already read like four papers on it, how where do you go from there? So there's a couple of papers that I found that were varying solutions of it. They exist again. The, Huge emphasis on the SAE da database, SVN, and then of course team leads as resources. These are the kind of things that really help in finding your own direction when it comes to some of these projects. So, uh, number three, I kind of skipped over that. Uh, keep an eye out for high level block diagrams. While they may not have specific mathematics on them, it'll definitely help with the logic side of it. Like I said, with mechatronics, when I did take that, you know, it may not have been for a specific product or for a, for a specific goal, but it definitely helped with future iterations of what I was working with. It was just kind of a good concept to just have other ways that people have done it. Maybe this way works better in your case and this one won't work as well, but it's good to have them on hand. So, all right, Spec uh, uh, specify requirements. Uh, each sub-team has a bunch of rules. Torque vectoring has very little. Uh, <laughs> The only limitation is you can't, uh, the only big limitation is that you cannot output more power to the tires than the driver is requesting. That's the big one. But rules are very important, so if you are going to be doing something like intake, I'm sure what, at least 40 pages in the, in the SAE rule book about yeah, that? Um, yeah, not quite as many. It's not like it's chassis or anything like that, but there's a decent amount of rules you need to read through and as right. far as geometrical requirements and setup and all that kind of stuff. Exactly. So, you know, for torque vectoring, it's easy for me to do it because it's only, you know, four or five different rules that I need to account for. But if you're doing a control system for another team, you do have to account for their rules as well as yours. So the control systems has its own set of rules. I don't know how long those are. Uh, because I'm doing torque vectoring, I don't really mess too much with that, luckily. Uh, but if you're talking about intake or chassis or, or, or any kind of other, you wouldn't really be doing control system for chassis. but or intake or something. You now have to account for their rules and at least know generally what's going on with that because 
you know, that's going to be pretty important moving forward. Um, and of course, just keep it in mind for every step of the process. Uh, the, yeah, and then just keep in mind your governing equations, inputs, outputs, goals. Just have that in your head along the way, every step of the way, so that way that if you do screw up somewhere or if there's a misstep somewhere, you can always reference back to that and just be like, okay, this is, this is what needs to change. Now I know specifically how to adapt it. Okay. All right, so creating a high-level diagram. I know this is a little scary, but we'll, it's, it's relatively simple when you take a look at it. So you see these little bubbles on that end. Those, guys. Um, those are going to be your variable inputs. So this would be for torque vectoring. Uh, this would be your, your friction coefficient. Uh, I made it variable just because in cold or hot temperatures it may change a little bit. It was just something I threw up there. Uh, and then your, a couple of your inputs from some of your devices. Uh, those are all going to be the inputs in, this, in the ovals on that side. Uh, the squares, constants. That's fairly simple. Obviously, when your calculations are dealing with constants, you need to put them in somewhere. Uh, and then these are going to be your outputs. Those are the ovals leading out. Um, high level, high, high, high level diagrams are basically going to be involving a lot of these guys. So it'll say torque allowable distribution or torque allow or torque distributor beta pitch error roll error. That's all you really need to know about those, right? In a super high level system, you don't necessarily need to know all the mathematics behind them. All you need to know is that that's their function and you move forward. So the reason I bring this up is because there are quite a few ways to uh, approach this or a few ways to approach this. Those being using by hand because you're going to have to make your equations anyway. You're going to need to know what your interactions with the system are going to be. So obviously you're going to sit down and do some calculations beforehand just to make sure that you know what's going on. Uh, there are a couple of good diagramming softwares online. A couple of them are free. Um, I am not familiar with them. I've always just used MATLAB because it's uh, a good tool that's supplied by the school and also through SAE. In fact, I highly recommend using the SAE one just because uh, some of the tools that come with the SAE one, it's a full version. So it allows you to do a lot more testing uh, on your own and not requiring an extra person. It allows for you to speed up the process. So. Uh, this is what this is Simulink. This would be number three. Um, Simulink is a function within MATLAB that allows you to essentially block out, uh, use a block diagram to map out this entire process. Uh, just helps with the logic of uh, the logic of it all. Uh, you can have something that reads out an output charts. Um, it works just like a calculator might. Uh, it, you you can vary your outputs, your inputs. You can change everything up. This is essentially just a giant. Uh, uh, mold of clay. This just kind of molds to your will. If you want to put something in, it'll just take it as is. If there's an error that comes with it, it'll tell you, but this, this is one of those, like, the most open-ended ways to approach a block diagram. It's just kind of diving in. Like I said, with block diagrams, it's much better to just kind of keep working at it and practice and drive and keep going. And, you know, start learning what all the functions are. It's relatively simple. Um, and, of course, like I said, it looks work beautifully. Um, so this is the first iteration of it. Uh, we're going to just quickly gloss, not gloss over, we're going to talk about the second iteration of this. So when you're doing control systems, you're going to have iterations. Your first iteration may not be as good as your second one, right? You, obviously, you're going to change and vary a lot of these things. So uh, just go back for a second. The, all these systems in here, we had a couple of things that were trying to account for vibration super early on. Uh, it ended up complicating that. It ended up complicating our code tremendously. It made our code something to the upwards of 80, sorry, 800 lines long on one end, 400 on the other one, 200 on the other one. It was just, it was just long, complicated. It, something that like any computer engineer looks at is like, all right, well, I'll just take a day and do this. But someone who's like a mechanical engineer, it's a little worrisome. So. We simplified it a little bit into this iteration. Does the same thing, but just doesn't account for vibrations yet. Just to make sure that a we can get a working model done first. If, if, as long as you get your your system mathematically working first and then add on to it, that's fine. And of course, like it, it just that's just how iterations are. You start simple, and then get more complicated. You don't want to just dive in and get the most complicated system possible, and then try and work backwards to get into the most simple. Right, you want to be as, as 
you want to start with baby steps and then go into a, a full sprint. It's not the other way around. Um, of course, it's fairly basic. It's just a calculational thing. So this is a minimum. So this would be like an error check. Um, it just those are going to be a big thing. I'll mention those in a little bit. But um, this is essentially making sure that our fundamental rule of does not exceed the input stays in place. So we've got our uh, maximum torque from the input, torque request, and it's just checking versus each of the torques of the individual tire. If, if it exceeds it, then it goes to the smaller value. If it does not exceed it, it stays with the smaller value. It stays safe. So we, I need to still make some adjustments here, but the idea is that no matter what, this system will, stay, will still stay in the realm of our rules. So, and of course the rest of it is just multiplying, dividing, signs, uh, just other constants. It, it's the same system as before, but just simplified and a little elongated. So, uh, later on if you guys have questions about this specifically, I'll be happy to answer them, but we'll just move forward with this. So, so the blocks are basically either like a constant or some sort of multiplication or some sort of mathematical. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then the ovals are your either your inputs that are changing or your outputs that are changing. Right. So one thing uh, that I might point out is that right here, you'll notice that these two are just kind of oddly placed uh, outputs. So the reason that those are just kind of oddly placed, for a coding perspective, um, you want to have those open-ended solutions so that they can link back to something else later on or early, earlier on. Uh, so the left to, left to com pops up right here. So because it's center of mass, COM center of mass, um, because of that, that's a new value, every 10 milliseconds or so, this will refresh as that old value. So this is essentially an error check to make sure that your system is completely up to date and it stays constant. Because you, you don't want to deal with, you know, you're, you're turning and then one second later your system's like, ah yes, we're turning. No, you want to turn right then and there. So ideally you just want to do it as iterative as possible. Make sure that your system is constantly essentially evolving with itself. So like for our work this uh, distribution system, like we're going to be accounting for bits and roll, but not y'all? Uh, some solutions do one, some solutions do the other. So right now, um, this system specifically relies on something called an IMU, which is an internal measurement uh, unit. Uh, that specifically allows us to have our yaw pitch and roll calculations. It gives us a, a yaw rate, a pitch rate, and a roll rate. Um, this calculation is based purely on the IMU. And then of course a varying center of mass which we have to calculate. Um, the issue being that the IMU is gonna be A, under a lot of vibration. B, we don't have one that we haven't built ourselves. So the, the best IMU units are pretty pricey. I'm sitting around a thousand dollars there. So we are, we're also trying to make a system that doesn't exclusively rely on this, or if we do end up getting the IMU, we're gonna have a secondary system that double checks the first system. So this specific, this specific system relies on pitch and roll. The other one relies on yaw. And of course yaw, because you're turning, it's just the, the X axis turning or whatever you're like steering, you essentially can just say that your yaw is your steering angle and you want to make it your ideal steering angle exactly what you input it onto you uh, as a driver, as a one-to-one. -one. So we have like all these solutions and they work in harmony with each other? Like, so they, they, they can. One system? Yeah, it completely depends on how you design it, but they, if, if, if you end up getting two systems that work at the same goal and they do give you the same outputs depending on whatever, then you can use the two of them to air check one another. So uh, I'll go into error in a little bit, but Essentially, it just helps make sure that your system is correct, uh, or at least is the most correct that it can be, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Right, so uh, developing a prototype, uh, obviously double check all of the logic that you used in the high level diagrams. Uh, were there any variables that required the use of complicated block calculation? If so, do you understand both why and how it works in the system? So, like I said, um, our early iteration had a vibration uh, something that accounted for vibration. Uh, 
we, we kind of understood it, but because there was kind of a lack of understanding of how specifically that thing functioned, um, when, we came, when it came to converting the code, when we were looking at it, it looked foreign to us. We didn't know what some of these variables accounted for or where they went to. So we ended up simplifying it so that at least we can understand what's going on. And like I said, you can't learn all of Simulink in one go. You kind of have to kind of learn as you go. So the simpler you start, the better. And if you want to find functions, obviously, background research is going to help tremendously with that. Um, do you have an error calculation or a way to correct a flawed input or output? So like I had shown you earlier, um, your new left to center of mass would vary uh, depending on how you're shifting or turning. So that's how you account for a flawed input because your, your, your left to center of mass would now be incorrect at any given turn, right? So you're correcting it by doing some kind of error function or you're taking the newest iteration of that value and starting the calculation over again. So just basic error calculation, that's just how it is. It's, it's you, you take the new value, you register it as the old, rerun the calculation. Uh, or, like we did here, uh, you error check whether or not that, uh, that torque input on the very top left there uh, is greater than or less than these things, all of these torque inputs, uh, and you double check it. Which one is higher, which one is lower, take the lower one. That would be an error calculation to account for not failing the rules, right? So, uh, have you tested your system within Simulink? Um, so the new iteration of, of MATLAB allows you to do that. It allows you to put an input from an IMU directly into this system. Uh, and up until two days ago, I hadn't had that before. So I'm still playing around with that function, but there's a lot of ways that you can do that using the tools that are given to you. Um, obviously, if you don't have that version of MATLAB or whatever, you have to go through and help the guys with the VCU or the computer engineers or software engineers who are used to doing this kind of stuff. Uh, and you have to kind of walk them through your logic and have them input the, the fake values essentially and like test an active movement or whatever. Um, if you're done with the above, you can now move to the conversion process. So I've been showing you guys the block diagrams this entire time. Um, I'm not gonna show you guys the other things because it's just a block of or like a giant wall of uh, code. It's not exactly an entertaining presentation that way. Um, but basically, MATLAB has a built-in function to convert all of your Simulink, uh, Simulink work into any kind of given code. Uh, it can vary from C++, C, ARM, uh, the bunch of others that I can't remember off the top of my head, but uh, it, it has a bunch of varying ways to do it. And uh, depending on what system you're working with, you want to convert it specifically to that one. So again, you'll have to talk to you or, uh, whoever's managing your VCU to, uh, to figure that out. Um, and one thing that might be helpful with this is currently for the testing process, and I'll go into that. Actually, we'll go into that now. Uh, <laughs> uh, so once the conversion, pro conversion is done, you've got to go through a whole debugging process. Obviously, you've got to get the code to work. Um, and this is where you're going to have to work closely with the VCU guys to make sure does it work with their system, does it interrupt any of their current systems, right? Because you want to make sure that if, if they already have like something inputting toward uh, torque or something, let's say for torque vectoring, uh, if they have something that's inputting to torque and then you're putting a separate calculation that for torque, they're kind of messing with each other. So you want to make sure that all of your process goes into the VCU smoothly. You don't want to just input it without telling anybody and then move on. Um, and then, of course, I, I highly recommend if you guys do want to do control systems, try learning the VCU. Um, I, it's just, it's one of those skills that I wish I picked up earlier. Um, it just, it's super helpful. I didn't have to rely on MATLAB. Uh, I wouldn't have to rely on MATLAB. I can do my own testing beyond that. Um, for all of you guys who are new, if you guys have summer, if you're not taking, or if you're not like super crazy with uh, internships or anything, uh, you'll have time to learn these things if you're interested, because this is, this is something that really does like take up time. So, uh, and of course, when you're testing these things, you need to, just like, just like any given part, you need to put it under your extreme uh, cases. So, for example, if I'm testing the torque vectoring, I'm gonna test it 
when the wheel is completely turned to the right, or whatever the angle ends up being is, I think it's 36 degrees, yeah. something like that. Um, essentially t testing it so that when you're at full turn, full uh, weight on your outside tires, are they experiencing more torque than this one? Will they be able to translate that into a proper turn, or is it going to understeer or oversteer? This is where you get your your test about uh, your test uh, uh, data. So, like a lot of that is going to be crucial to like making the next iteration, to fixing the next process for designing. Um, and of course, if it's successful, just look for ways to optimize it. If it's not, back to the drawing board. Relatively simple process there. So, a uh, couple of recommendations: uh, find all of your variables. Um, even even if you don't meet them, all of your variables need to be found because. Actually, case in point, my the current iteration of torque vectoring, um, we assumed that we only needed the IMU, and so we didn't account for another set of variables that we did need. We didn't think that we needed the suspension. We didn't think we needed the turning. We didn't need think we needed the RPM. We just needed purely IMU's movement. But because of the complication of not being able to get an IMU or having too much vibration with the IMU, we had to make a new system. We now have to account for that many more variables that we hadn't thought of yet. So look into it and find as many of the variables as you can possibly find that you think would be relevant. And try and work some of them into your solution. Or if others don't fit to your solution and something fails in your first iteration or second iteration, you can look back to those other variables and be like, OK, maybe those are important. Maybe those have a factor in this system that we need to worry about. So. That's kind of the big thing there. Um, learn each necessary part, variable, or system used for your particular project, knowing these factors will help in later simulation stages. Um, you don't need to be as big of an expert as, as uh, like for example, Ben is in the intake process. But you need to understand it at least to some of the extent that he, he understands it. Because in order to make a correctional uh, control system, you're going to need to know how the system works. You're going to need to know why it does what it does. You're going to need to know at least on a baser level why it's functioning or how it's functioning. You don't need to necessarily know each individual bearing or part or screw or whatever, but you need to know how it works. Um, and then, of course, don't be afraid to ask for any un unknown information from any subs teams. Uh, you're not expected to know everything. I've already gone over all that. So um, in a nutshell, that's basically control systems. Um, it's a lot of testing. It's a lot of uh, it's a lot of uh, making your models with block diagrams, and it's a lot of just running through numbers. Um, it's it's a bit of a complicated task, but it doesn't quite take as long as it would for designing an actual part. Um, it's fairly it's a fairly easy process once you've gotten through the first iteration, because now it's just a rinse and repeat process to figure out okay. Now I know that these set of variables work, these values are working, I just need to optimize it. So now what can you do to make it a better system every iteration? So, yeah. Is there a specific package within Simulink that you wind up using, or are these blocks just available on like, right when you open up Simulink? Okay, so what I showed you guys, this guy and this guy, both of those are, uh, those are <laughs> both of them are uh, packaged with the student version of Simulink, or with MATLAB rather. All of this comes with what the school provides you, that this part's not the problem. The issue is, is that some of the extra tools that come with it, so for example, the, the IMU, which is part of the aer aer uh, aeronautical section. Again, I haven't looked into it because today, this week's just been hectic, but uh, I had just downloaded it a couple days ago. So. Those, block, those blocks come with the full version, and those are incredibly beneficial to the testing portion. Mm -hmm. So, you know, now if we do end up using the IMU, now there is a built-in IMU within Simulink that I can use, test, vary the values, and so on. Kind of validate it. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So it, it essentially skips the process of having to convert it, send it to VCU, wait for VCU to integrate it, test it, bring it back to you, tell you what's wrong with it, because now you can just sit there and it's like, all right, Simulink's done. Punch in the, uh, the IMU, run a bunch of values through them. You can actually vary the values through them. Awesome. And then having like a chart that pops up at the end here. It's a full simulation tool. Okay. Yeah. yeah. 
yeah, as far as control systems go, it just gives you the pure values, but yes, it is a it is a simulation tool for sure. Yeah. So like many of the values like on the left that we're gonna be like put in bunny, mm -hmm. like we, we can't really account for until the EV car is like fully built, right? Like especially like center mass or No, because we do have um, we do have the full model on the SVN. So we do have a general idea of where the center of mass is. Um, obviously it's gonna be a little different when it's fully built. Some things may change, some things may not. Um, currently what I'm looking into is how the human body changes the center of mass of the car, because I know where the center of mass of the vehicle is, but the mechanics of where the person shifts to, because our car is only 600 pounds or so, you know, 150 pounds of somebody shifting their weight will change where the center of mass is, especially as, since you're taking a turn, you know, your your uh, your turning forces as well are gonna account for a change in your center of mass. So it's, while technically, yeah, the car is on the SVN, there's still a lot of extra calculations that are gonna need to be done. So like I said, a lot of the factors, like the human element was something that I didn't think of, you know, two quarters ago. It was just not something I really accounted for. I was just looking at base symbol, uh, like the, the basis of the shifting weight. Right, just the two, the four tires experiencing the shift in weight with the IMU, and that was it. But now that we're not using the IMU, we have to account for that shift in weight by looking at whatever the body's position is, uh, how it's turning, how it moves, and so on. So, if that answers your question, does anybody else have anything to ask? All right, well, thanks for your time. I'll be here for a little bit longer if you guys have any more, more questions, and um, good luck with your projects. Yeah, thank you. Good presentation. That was really well done. Yeah. That's going to set a really good baseline for everybody who comes through. Yeah. 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 Yeah, uh, uh, the, 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 the way that we do <laughs> 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 <laughs>